property doctrine often gives people opportunities to argue, well, even though I didn't possess in the most literal sense, even though I didn't acquire in the most literal, literal sense, I should still be regarded as the, the person who ended up being the proprietor. And there was a custom in the 19th century, and it, uh, in the, especially in New England, among whalers. And whale, if you, when a whaling company fitted a boat and the boat hit a whale, more often than not, the whaling company could not be able to pull the whale right in there and bring the whale back. Whaling companies and all the people who resided in the beach towns up and down New England settled on a custom. The whaling companies would have these specialized marks on their lances and every company had its own special markings. The whale would wash up onto shore and then everybody in New England knew you then sent the lance to Provincetown on, on Cape Cod and at Provincetown then th there'd be a, a, a bazaar or a forum and a whaling company representative would be there and if the lance came back they'd send representatives to go get the whale and they'd pay the person who, who found the whale a, a, like a 10 or 15 percent finder's fee for the fine and then the company would get back the whale. So that custom was not consistent with rules of capture. The beach resident who finds the whale ends up with the, as the person who's in control of it. It's on that person's land. And the, the, uh, the, like normally if capture requires total physical control, the whaling company did not establish total physical control. They didn't lash the whale to the side of the boat. But the, the, the uh, courts that dealt with, saw this custom said, this custom is a perfectly sensible way to carry capture norms and property norms into effect when you're dealing with a special case like a whale. The whaling company is laboring in a moral sense when it fits out a boat, borrows lots of money to buy the boat and the equipment, borrows money to pay the workers and sends or the, the, the seamen and sends the boat out to then spend lot, like six weeks finding a whale and getting it. All that activity is product, morally productive. All that activity finds the whale and brings the whale into human commerce. And the, the whaling company does something that's kind of sort of some form of capture when it puts a, a, a bomb lance that has markings on it. The markings claim possession as much as it's going to be done consistent with the labor. So in that sense, labor justifies having these possession rules, but then when real bright line possession rules don't facilitate labor so well, then courts are willing to relax bright line possession rules and go to more flexible possession rules to reward the labor. And it's important to understand and study these rules when you're dealing with whales just to see how these rules work out in the common law. There are exam examples like this still in the common law today, and the best example in contemporary litigation would be about boats that sink. If a boat that sinks and another a boat comes along trying to salvage the old boat, does the boat need to pull up the sunken boat? Is it enough for the boat to leave a buoy over the sunken boat? Is it enough to have a video camera that does what's called telepossessions and gets a picture of the boat on the, surf the, on the surface of the ocean? The same ideas that from the whale cases apply forward. And then even when you're dealing in a really sophisticated economy with very formalized property rights with deeds or rec record systems, these, these same basic ideas about facilitating search uh, via labor and having clear rights of possession, you can then evaluate recordation systems and deed systems by whether they carry into effect the same policies that the common law is thinking about when it's talking about possession and labor.